Welcome to the Brian Rue Show. It's February the 2nd, 2018. My guest is Robbie in New Zealand. First time I've ever done a video from New Zealand. And uh, Robbie's a flat earther. So so this video is, uh, I would guess I would call it, the earth is not flat again. So I'm, uh, I'm a spherical earther and Robbie's a flat earther. So we're going to have a debate, I guess. So welcome to the show, Robbie. Hey, thanks for having me. And um, for my channel, uh, I run a YouTube channel as well, which is called CBS. And on my channel, it's going to be called Brian, You're Wrong, The Earth is Flat. Okay, yeah, yeah. your channel means Calling All Bullshit. Yeah, CBS on YouTube. And that's linked below this video. It's called Just CBS, your own YouTube channel. Yeah, forgive me, I got a bit of a cold. I might sneeze here. I was out actually last night. We had... Um, the lunar eclipse here, and I was out for an hour and a half at five in the morning. But I seem to have gotten a bit of a cold. Um, maybe tell the audience a little bit about yourself, and then we can get into uh, the nature of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm basically a creative type, um, yeah, self-employed, and I've been getting into conspiracy theory, um, or what you know gets called conspiracy theory, which is usually conspiracy fact, for uh, probably about ten years. And I started getting a bit more serious about it um, when I started my current job, which allows me to basically listen to podcasts and audio books all day, every day. And um, yeah, I guess I've always had an inquiring mind, and I pretty quickly found out that what we've been told about, you know, uh, damn near everything I'm coming to figure out these days is either straight up lies or only half truths. Yeah, I guess I'd have to agree with that. There's also mention of the audience. This is another career first where we're using screen share on Skype. You're presenting your slides, so you're much more technically advanced than myself. So I thought, this is a great idea for Skype. I've never actually done this before. Yeah, so, very good. Me, but, um, yeah, I'm glad to help. Yeah, so I guess my my position is um, the world's spherical. And my, my um, I guess, my view is around 2015, I started to notice these um, flat earth videos. And I made a video on my birthday on... Um, December 13th, 2015, it's on YouTube called um, The World is Spherical in Shape. And then I made one about a year later with Jan Lampert in um, South Africa called Jew Shock When Whites Go Wonky and Believe the Flat Earth. So that's my, my public statement. On, but my view is that um, I, I feel this is um, a disinformation to make truthers like us look bad because people like Eric Dubay is perhaps most famous flat earther. He's he's anti-Jewish supremacy. He's pro-Hitler, but he's a flat earther. So what I my very first impression was probably the international Jews are behind this to discredit us, and they're probably having a good laugh in Tel Aviv, saying like Eric Dubay says, it's a Jewish conspiracy that the world's uh, a sphere when it's flat, and I, I can just see these. Jews laughing about that, so <laughs> that, gonna... that's my position. I'll, I'll give you a chance. Yeah, you, I'll yeah, yeah, let you go next. Um, I have to say, you're both right about that. Um, I think the, you know, it's, it's a Jewish conspiracy on two levels. Um, I think you know, it was rolled out for public consumption, and you know, the flat earthers are basically looked at as the height of ignorance and they knew that only certain people would actually look into the topic and they probably also knew that when certain people did look into it they'd find there was something to it and people like me once I you know I went into it thinking it was absolutely ridiculous as everyone else did but you know there were a few things that were brought up in the some of the first videos that came out that just made me think maybe you know it can't be but I can test this for myself so that's what I did and um, you know after the first uh, curvature test I did I thought maybe there's something to it uh, but I needed more proof so I did another one and over a longer distance and yeah I couldn't find any curvature there either I'll show you a bit of that one Okay, while you're doing that, I just want to mention, um, I do have a few friends 
who believe in the flat earth. So um, I don't just reject people. I realize, you know, in, intelligent people who watch a lot of videos uh, m might believe this. So, um, you know, I don't I don't just reject people. And it's something I have looked into, and I've decided, well, I think the world's spherical. But, um, yeah, I don't insult people's intelligence because um, – I feel intelligent people can be misled. I've been misled on things in the past and would be embarrassed to admit about. So at least that's my attitude. So, yeah, let's take a look at your slides here. This is great, Robbie. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not very good at explaining these things, so it's much better for me to have a video to show you. Um, so in this one, I took photos of the mountains. I live in Wellington, New Zealand. This is the southern coast of Wellington and these mountains are much further away than you'd think. So I took photos of them from a few different vantage points around the southern coast. And I'll just get up to... Let's go check out these mountains. So yeah, this is them. They're a long way away. 93 and 81 miles so it turns out that um, you know I used um, charts that I found on the internet which were put up there by skeptics you know who thought this whole flat earth thing was rubbish so they actually went out of their way to you know write these um, I think this is done in a spreadsheet or something but it turns out that um, this mountain should be obscured up to 1604 meters which would only leave 1004 meters above the horizon and we go to the end and um, you can see all the way down to sea level there's pretty much none obscured except what is obscured by the waves in the foreground so um I, in later videos, I devised a a new curvature test, which I don't think anyone else has figured out, which um, is basically using, taking the laws of perspective into account and using um, a bunch of different mountains as reference points and so, yeah, I've chosen these four mountains. And I have plotted the altitude um, of each mountain and the distance from the camera on a graph. And um, I tested this for myself. It turns out that you can run a vertical line down the um, y-axis of the graph and... I'll just let the video play. Um, so at any point on the graph, if these... Um, hang on. Yeah, okay, there we go. So that is um, just a line going um, on the y-axis of the graph to account for perspective. And it matches the mountains in the photos almost perfectly and that is impossible on a curved surface like um, you know the mountains are all different distances away and different heights and it, it's literally it can't happen on a curved surface so this proves flat out that there's no curvature like but it, um, I think the, the official story is that for every mile out, the, there's an 8-inch drop in the curvature, right? There's 8 inches per mile. So why couldn't there just be an 8-inch drop for every mile? If that's like 10 miles away, 80 inches curvature. Um, I don't think you're quite getting it. Like, uh, I even, I went further than that in my, um, another video. But the previous video um, shows how much drop I mean, how much um, of the mountains we should be seeing, and it's up to, we should only be seeing the tops of them above that yellow line. It's, but so it's only eight, eight inches per mile. How many miles away is that? Is that 10 uh, miles away, that, 20 miles 90, away? 90 miles. 
That's 90 miles. Yeah. So what's 90 times 8? Um, it's still not it, that much. A, no, right? it's 1,600 meters for, no. No, no, if yeah, you take it, 90, it's, it's, um, it's 72 plus um, 0, right? Um, is that 720 okay. inches, right? It's be 720 inches, no, which no, is no, 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 no. about wrong. 12 feet. Um, okay, I'll find, since we can do the screen share thing, um, I'll find an online curvature test calculator, and I can show you on that. It shows here for um, for one mile, 0.67 feet, for two miles, 2.67 feet, for three miles, 6 feet, for four miles, 10 feet, and it gets exponentially bigger for each mile to account for the curve. No, I'm sorry, what was it for one mile? You're saying is 0.8 feet? Uh, 0.67 feet. And uh, is that, that's 8 inches, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 8 but, inches. But for two miles, 2.67 feet. For three miles, 6 feet. Because it gets, um, you know, for each... For each mile, you're going out on that axis from the viewer. The, yeah. drop, the drop is larger. Do you see what I'm oh, so it's at? Yeah, I see what you're saying. So uh, from 1 to 2 is quite a big jump. From 2.57 to two, for 2 miles, you're saying. Yeah, you've got it at last. Yes, yeah, so I, I didn't realize that. Yeah. But that, that's, that's a table for a spherical Earth, right? Yeah, yeah. And we use that to prove that there's no curvature. So if I go back to my video, um, I will have to go back to a uh, different one. Um, just a second. Back to curvature test part two. Yeah, so these are a long way away. So, um, like, yeah, eight, I think 80 and 90 miles, something like that. So we go back to this table. Um, yeah, look at the tip. What's so it for 90 miles? 90 miles is one mile of curvature. There should be a one mile curvature for 90 miles? Is that yep. what it says? Yep. Yeah, so, did you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it yeah, said so, there should be one mile for 90 miles. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I've worked that out in a couple of different ways. Um, the eight inches per mile squared one um, is, is good, but it's not not real accurate. Um, see, this guy's using um, trigonometry to work it out. But I have the right to have an attorney present. I'd like to talk to my solicitor before <laughs> agreeing to the Pythagorean proof of curvature, whether that chart is true or not. I've never seen it before. Yeah, well, I, I <laughs> promise you, I've been looking into this for two and a half years, and this is one of the first, first things that I started to get my head around, you know, um, because that's like the the basis of the whole flat earth movement really. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but the most fundamental thing is where's the curvature? You know, we expect that we should be seeing. Yeah, well, we could, we could talk about other aspects of it. You could finish what you want to say here about yeah, this, and then yeah. we could talk about uh, you know other arguments involved. Yeah, we expect that we should be seeing a mile of curvature there, but as you can see, you can pretty much see all the way down to sea level. And... Um, yeah, that second test that I did was because, like, the main argument against this is they're saying that you get light refraction, you know, like um, like different layers of temperature and water vapor and whatnot. Um, apparent. Well, it does bend light to a degree, but um, that's why I did this test. I took photos in a bunch of different um temperatures and times of the day and seasons and um you know it makes no difference there's still so you're saying um the first um, mile of height should be disappeared or should be over the curve so what we're looking at you should just see a, a, over above a mile that's what you're saying but yeah. that's not what you're yeah, actually seeing. Only be seeing that's your the, point right the tops of the mountains pretty much um because the mountain's higher than a mile high, right? It's higher yeah, than 5,000 yeah, yeah. feet. Yeah, they, they're um, 40, 
4,400 feet and 3,200 feet. So we should only be seeing above about there, you know, only the top peaks of the two tallest ones. Yes, the, so that's your point, yeah. And I was thinking, uh, my, well, think of eight inches per mile for 90 would have been much smaller, and you're saying it's um, according to that graph. So I guess um, I'd have to agree to disagree at this point, but do you, we can finish off, you want to say about this, and we can mm -hmm. talk about other aspects of the flat Earth if you want. Yeah, yeah, well, what are you disagreeing about? Um... Um, well, I guess that the chart saying a mile for 90 miles, I think it was 24,000 miles around, because um, I'm thinking 90 miles from here, like where I live in Vancouver, BC, 90 miles is the town of Hope. Um, can't imagine the Earth curving an entire yeah, mile. Yeah, well, it turns out um, it does. You know, I didn't, I didn't think that either. But you know, you look at this chart and it goes up to um, 3,959 miles, and that's the radius of the Earth, right? 3,959 miles. So there's 3,959 miles of curvature. Yeah, yeah. And follow the chart up, and you'll see that there is, in fact, you know, it's correct. There's no arguing with this. It's that is what it is. Okay. Um, can we go on to other things? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Um, um, oh, oh, well, one thing I'll mention. Um, last year, my my girlfriend flew to uh, China, and. Um, and then she, after that, she flew to Germany, and then she flew, you know, to Canada, and then she flew to Vancouver. So she went around the world, like, in a, in a circle, because she flew west from Vancouver, Canada, where I live, <laughs> to China. She kept going, um, I'm sorry, um, she was going, yeah, west. She kept going west, and she landed back in Vancouver, so she went around the world. How, how do you explain that? Um, just a second. Um this one's pretty much just for show, but it's good for... I'm really impressed with your graphics. I think we're going to get some higher ratings than the Brian Roo Show. This kind of huh. graphics is a step up for the Brian Roo Show. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no problem. And you went to a lot of trouble. You, how many hours did you put into this, Robbie? Oh, countless, you know, like just learning, figuring out the 3D software. Um, uh, it, it took a long time, but, you know, I've been... I'm a computer geek from way back, I mean, so... That raises a philosophical question. You and I know about the problem of the international Jewish power taking over the world. Don't you think that's more important than the flat earth? Well, <laughs> this, the reason I reckon this is so important is because when people figure this out, they start questioning everything else. Um, and I've seen it a lot. You know, people realize that they've been lied, about, lied to about this um, and what else, and they start you know, looking into everything else, and um, yeah, like the the moon landing, I'd say is a big hoax. Apollo was a moon landing hoax. I made a video about that at Christmas time. I guess you'd certainly agree with that, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, totally. It took me a few years to um, admit that to myself. So you know, like um, I always love sci-fi, and you know, yeah, me too. I, I, I was. And we're also proud of the moon landing, right? Yeah, yeah. And we're yeah. also I, proud I of that, that as so human cool. beings. Like all my life, I thought that was so cool, but then you know, I looked into it critically, and it all started to fall apart. But anyway, um, back to the flights around the world. Um, the map that most flat earthers use looks pretty much like this, with the North Pole in the center, and um, so anywhere you are on the map. Um, north is the North Pole and south is Antarctica, which is forms sort of an ice wall around the edge. Um, yeah, I've seen this many times, yeah, yeah. So, and there's kind so, of a, a firmament or a dome yeah, above it. Yeah, yeah, so you can fly around the world um, like that, you know, like it's going around the circumference rather than around um, a ball. So okay, so, so the example of my girlfriend, can you explain how she flew? There's North America you have there. She flies around here to China. I don't know. I guess my cursor's on the screen, right? Yeah. Oh, and then she oh, flies no, to uh, Europe. We're not and then she goes your, back. So, okay, North America to China, so around there, then to Europe. And then where did she go? Um, to, to Germany. To Germany. And then she flew back, I guess, to the 
to Canada, like Toronto, and then she flew to yeah. Vancouver. So Toronto, Vancouver is just, you know, yeah, pretty over much here on the, the West same. Coast. Here's Vancouver here. That's North America, isn't it? Uh, yeah, up yeah. There. yeah, yeah, yeah. So over here is the West Coast. Yeah, that's uh, the West Coast. Yeah, so um, Germany to, hang on, oh, yeah, uh, Toronto to Vancouver. So you're saying the pilot kept veering to the right. He's going in a circle. That's what you're saying. Well, for each leg, um, I mean, it's only very slight. And the fact that they're navigating by north and south anyway, east and west, is, um, you know, it's going to pretty much just look like a straight line anyway because of the vast distances involved. So that's not a problem. But, um how can a pilot flying a plane not realize that the world's flat if uh, he's lot, flying a, a plane? Them, a lot of them are, you know, um, because, you know, for most of my life I thought that I was seeing curvature out the window, but, um, you know, it turns out since I started looking into this, um, take photos out the window and the horizon's dead flat. So, um, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. In my first video about that, I pointed out, though, if you're, if you're standing on the ground, you can only see so high. But if you're on a tall building, you can see further. On a plane, you can see further. Because of the curve of your earth, you can see further, but then it drops off. At some point, you can't see any further. Uh, so that, I think it, that supports it, the curve of the earth. No, nah, not at all. It's just because you're higher. You know, you've got a better vantage point, and it... Um, yeah, that that's all there is to it, really. You've got less thing, less obstructions, but um, in your way, basically, is what it comes down to. I think the conventional argument is that because the curvature is so slight on a you know, eight thousand mile radius planet that you just don't see it. But that doesn't mean that it's not yeah, round. But it's as, just that you don't as see I've it. just demonstrated, is more than you think, you know. Um, and it turns out that when um, it's been worked out if there, if the Earth was curved as um, it's been presented to us since we were so young, you know, too young to really question it, um, you wouldn't see curvature um, from a plane at that sort of altitude, you know, like you'd have to go up a whole lot higher. And, um, you know, people, flat earthers have launched balloons with cameras on them up to I think about 130,000 feet and still completely flat horizon, no curvature. Well, I guess we can kind of agree to disagree, but are you saying pilots are in a conspiracy? Pilots know it's flat, but they don't. They keep oh, it a no, secret. No. Pilots like, are in a um, massive conspiracy all over the world to not tell us that the world's no, flat. No, no. Is that what they, you're saying? They, you know, they've just been told, like everyone, that, you know, we live on a ball, and why would you question it? Like, uh, because it turns out that you wouldn't see curvature anyway if um, we lived on a ball with a radius of 3,600 miles. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't make any difference, you know. Like, they were told that um, the Earth's curved, um, and why would you question it? Why would? Well, I think because in that example, um, they would have to be turning right, flying in a circle between Vancouver to China and around. Yeah, so they would know that they're they're curving to the right. They would know they're flying in a yeah, circle. It's a long way, and like you know, pilots um, flying that dif distance is fly by wire anyway. You know, um, they're not at the controls for half of the flight, but um, as that gradual that you wouldn't even notice you'd just be even like if it wasn't set to fly by wire you'd just be um following your instruments you know your charts well, and your well with instruments wouldn't instruments indicate that the world's flat and the earth have side, satellites bou bouncing off their gps you know wouldn't that wouldn't that them show them the shape of the earth with their instrumentation Oh, well, it turns out that, um, yeah, satellites are just balloons. Um, that's something, um, actually, I can show you. You know, satellites have been thoroughly debunked. First thing I need to show yeah. you is... Um, you can show me, sure.
satellite photo in space. I'll turn off caps lock so it doesn't look like I'm yelling. So yeah, it's all CGI. I mean, or you know, or just fakes. I think um, yeah, since people have been figuring it out, maybe they've been going to a bit more effort. Um, like this one looks reasonably convincing. Oh no, it's CGI. How about this one? Ah, taking too long. Um, well, see, my response to that is um, you can see 1965 color videos of the Gemini missions. So look at the film technology they possessed in 1965 with film cameras in space. You see color, the blue earth, the Gemini capsules. There was no CGI in 1965. How do you explain that? Um, uh well, basically, NASA has been faking everything. They don't go up into orbit because the whole, you know, infinite vacuum of space, we've proven it pretty much to be um, a fabrication. It's impossible. So they've faked well, everything. Well, I agree that space is, is not a vacuum. I did um, a video with Pete Papa Heracles saying that basically Einstein lied saying space is a vacuum and Tesla said that there's ether, that ether, ether is kind of this energy which we can tap into for free energy. It's a Jewish conspiracy through Einstein to tell us. Einstein said, all my theories would be false if space was not a vacuum. So I agree, space was not, is not a vacuum, but that doesn't make the Earth yeah, well, um, flat. And uh, what about these that, 1965 color films? How do they have the Hollywood technology at that time to fake these, these videos from space? Hang on, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, there's so much to this. Um, okay, back to satellites. Um, they've crashed a couple of times, and it turns out that they're connected to balloons. Um, and I uh, yeah, the back to the vacuum or the not vacuum of space. The whole premise of satellites they need like a vacuum or near vacuum to orbit. They can't orbit the Earth um, if there is, you know, a ball Earth without a vacuum. Otherwise, um, you know, the Earth gravity would just pull them down. Well, that, that's fair enough. But if, if Tesla's saying there's ether, it can be so so thin that the a satellite could still go around the Earth for like a thousand years. They say Sputnik or whatever will last a th thousand years. But still, like these satellites are in geosynchronous orbit, like 24,000 miles out. There's plenty of time for the orbit to decay, even if there's a slight bit of ether there. I don't, I don't think that's a problem for orbiting a satellite. Mm, all, all the, um, uh, like I said, it's such a big topic, um, and orbiting, you know, and all the calculations that they've used. Um, for their supposed, um, you know, missions to the other planets. It relies on a vacuum out there, you know. All the calculations are based upon the big G gravity formula and the fact that it's a vacuum up there and the fact, you know, the gravitational pull of each um, giant flying sphere up there. It all depends on having an infinite vacuum so well, we that. can talk about that. Do you want to finish your, your balloon thing? Because um, you're saying satellites exist, but they're held up by balloons, and our yeah. cell phones yeah. with GPS so, are bouncing off of balloons. So, so it works the same, basically. You know, a geosynchronous um, satellite is one that's basically just um, staying above the same spot of the Earth. So imagine that instead of um, them being orbiting up there, they're just on a high altitude balloon. Um, but these balloons are unstable. They're going to be moving around, and the cell phones are always working all the time. Like, how can balloons be stable enough to maintain all of all of our cell phones and all of our satellite uh, interdependency? Uh, right? I, I haven't looked into that um, in a lot of detail. You know, like. <laughs> but still, for you to to say that the world's flat, aren't you obligated to look into that in a lot of detail? Like, well, can you really explain so much to, uh, satellites so much. and balloons? And I was at the um, 
Kennedy Space Center in November. How do you explain all these Apollo rockets going up and Gemini rockets and space shuttles? Like we we see with the naked eye, you see these rockets going up and then they curve into the they curve a bit to, to establish an orbit around they, they the Earth. Curve, How do you explain rockets? I mean, just they, and you can't, it does not explain satellites. We see rockets t- taking off. We see films of them, right? Yeah, but have you ever seen a film of a rocket actually going? Up through the atmosphere into space, um, like they never showed. That. Well, they yeah. have cameras like uh, I think um, SpaceX. They have a camera going all the way up, and then the thing comes down. Um, they've had cameras like um, the famous film of the 1968 Apollo. They see the the uh, the first stage dropping. You see the ring dropping off the space, and the second stage blasting. They have a camera going all the way up into space. Yeah, so um, who is um, operating the cameras? Um, like, there's just so many holes. Well, just in a that. camera m- m- mounted within the, uh, the the Apollo rocket itself. They yeah. just have a mounted camera. So when this first stage goes down, there's a camera mounted right there watching the stage Anyone? go down in the ring. Yeah. It's a very famous so, film. Down, Everyone's seen down. that, um, that yeah, film. It's too, much, too much for me to think about. Um, but here are rocket launches. They don't go into space, they curve and basically drop in the ocean. Um, well, I, I would say they curve because in order to get into orbit, you don't go straight off of planet Earth. You, you actually curve to establish or, orbit. That's the point. And like the, and the space shuttle is only within 400 miles because, you know, the, the deadly Van Allen belt, which is why they couldn't have gotten to the moon, begins after 400 miles. So... The space shuttle only has to go up about 300 miles, so it goes up and it curves. I mean, that doesn't sound like a conspiracy, does it? Um, I need need more time, but hang on. Um, Like I said, it's much easier to show this via videos, and in the time that I'm, like, looking up videos, you're moving on to the next thing, so... um, Okay, I guess I should go easy on you here, but I guess my point is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. <laughs> yeah, they do. And if you reflect that um, back to the um, whole construct that we've taken for granted all our lives, um, how do you explain that you have like a near-perfect vacuum of outer space right next to the atmosphere of Earth? Like, should, Vacuum is like, um, it's going to suck the um atmosphere right off you know like uh, well i'd say it's gravity like yeah, gravity but, holds the, the atmosphere and although really gra- i would gravity say gravity is such a weak force like um hang on ah gravity versus a vacuum although technically i would say maybe gravity does not exist people like tesla was saying that actually it's some form of electricity we, we, we use the word gravity but no one Officially, even understands what gravity is or how it works. I think it might be some kind of electrical attraction between bodies. Yeah, so I would say I there's some kind of attraction of the atmosphere to the planet. I think it's electromagnetic as well. I agree with you on that. But um, when it comes down to it, like a vacuum is immensely powerful. Like um, this video is showing vacuum lifters. Um, so, yeah, this, this is like. Commercial strength vacuum lifters. So, um, and that's not even, you know, the vacuum of outer space is like at least that powerful. It would suck the atmosphere right off, you know. And you can't have a zone of pressure right next to a vacuum. It's physically impossible. Well, I appreciate you putting these videos together so quickly as I talk about a bang you got a video it's very impressive Rob how did you prepare for this um uh, like I say I've been looking into this for a few years now so um yeah I, I guess you could say I've been studying for years well I suppose my answer to that is um so with what we call gravity or electricity we have this massive earth there and um if you're if you have air in space it would be attracted to the gravity of the body and it would go there rather than just being in space because there is a gravitational pull so to me it makes sense that the yeah, atmosphere would stick saw, around the earth um, okay the, this thing that the vacuum lifter is lifting up is fighting against gravity and that's a brick 
you know, the atmosphere is like, it's like a millionth of the um, density of a brick. So, and that's just vacuums right there, you know. Um, it's the same principle. So vacuums... Is that really, is that really just vacuums? Can yeah, carry a yeah. brick that heavy? Yeah, you can carry... Um, the, these are like, you know, 5, 10 tons, something like that. This is a vacuum lifter. Well, you see, I have the right to have an attorney present before making any public statements on this video. <laughs> uh, I'm not expecting you to make a public statement, but as long as you let me, um, you know, put I guess forth I, I just, evidence. Not, I guess I can't concede that uh, that's true. I'll just uh, maybe just withhold and not comment on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I know yeah. that. Because <laughs> I'm still a spherical earther. I'm not a flat earther. <laughs> yeah, well, it turns out that um, the original... Buddhist model was um, a flat earth model. Well, actually, the, the Buddha stated we live on a world sphere. It's, it's right in the, in the Pali Sutras. He even just said we live in a galaxy, call it a island universe, which is a good way to describe what we think of as a galaxy because galaxies are flat, planets, planets are spherical. The Buddha said we live on, in a world sphere and he even described an era, um, sure an era of universe circle? expansion and universe contraction, which we think of as the Big Bang. So it's astonishing. In my first book, uh, Freeing the Buddha from 1999, I've got a chapter, All, all Universes Mythology, you know, des describing this. Right, because I've been looking at um, Buddhist models, and this is a Tibetan one, um, and it shows... Um, yeah, basically a flat plane, and I think this symbolizes Mount Meru in the middle, um, and it's surrounded by ocean, and these are supposed to be continents. Um, and, yeah, recently, in the last year or so, um, this, this is um, from a newspaper in the 1940s, um, and the text that goes with it, see this shows pretty much the standard flat earth map, but surrounded by um, some more, um, which could be the worlds, you know, um, which could have different, more advanced beings on it for all we know, you know, like, uh, yeah, none of us flat earthers, um, well, any that, uh, you know, you should listen to, um, we don't say we know the whole constructs, this realm that we're living in. And by the way, Tesla called it a realm. He said, we don't live on a planet, we live on a realm, in a realm. <laughs> well, well, the Buddha would say a human realm, but getting back to Mount Meru, um, yeah, I know in the, the Buddha suttas, like I've read all 6,000 pages of the Buddha's work, he talks about Mount Meru being a kind of mountain in the middle, in the different levels of heaven. But it is kind of... Um, our tradition, we, we teach that it's kind of a mythological idea, but aside from that, the Buddha does actually say the world's spherical. Are you sure he you know? doesn't say also, that it's round? Well, we have realms of existence, no, like round, there's six, six heavens, or like realm is R-E-A-L-M. No, no. There's the human realm, the animal realm, the ghost realm, the heavenly realm with the devas. Yeah, but that doesn't no, mean no, that the no, world's hang flat. On, me up. Round, R-O-U-N-D, as opposed to sphere. Round, as in a circle. Oh, round, okay, yeah. round, yeah. Not a sphere. Oh, like a circle. Well, yeah. round could be spherical. Round could be spherical, right? Well, no, it's spherical is. There's always been a word for spherical. Round means round. Well, in the in the Pali Suttas, like the, 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 the translated, do use the word sphere. But saying that, that we live in a world sphere, we even said that this earth is built on on liquid. He just, the yeah. Buddha described um, uh, volcanoes and earthquakes. Yeah, okay, okay. This so earth check this out. Um, the sphere that they're talking about is probably the same sphere that the uh, Hebrew cosmology, Navajo cosmology, Inca cosmology, Mayan, Hindu, Norse, Egyptian, they've all pretty much got a sphere which is enclosing a flat plane and the heavens are within the sphere and um, yeah, yeah I've seen that on, on a Michael Tellinger video you know Michael Tellinger is a flat earther did you know that yeah yeah I've been um, following that guy for years eh? and I was stoked to me I, I met him here in Vancouver on, on two two tours and I had a beer with him once and 
I met him. So to me, he's like the most prominent flat earther. When I saw this, I thought, oh, no, we've lost Michael mm-hmm. Tellinger. We've lost yeah, him to the flat earthers. Like nice oh, guy. so uh, sad. Um, <laughs> I just yeah. saw this a few months ago. Oh, well, hopefully, but, you'll, um, hopefully you'll come around there. Hopefully you'll think about what I've been presenting to you and, you know, um, just realize well, that. Well, show me more proof. Like I, I have still other other reputations. Like, him. <laughs> what about uh, you saw my video where, where I described um, the ancient Greeks went to Egypt. Ah, you're talking about June twenty first of the summer solstice. You saw the shadow went straight down. Then another summer solstice went to Greece and it was at a different angle. So from that, yeah, he could calculate yeah. the whole circumference of the Earth. He calculates about twenty five thousand miles, quite accurate. Yeah, and he calculated from that that the world's round. This was like sixth century BC in Greece. Yep, I know it well. Um, if you go into it with the supposition that the Earth's a sphere, um, you come out with that conclusion. But it turns out that um, with the standard um, model that Flat Earth is sort of um, building from uh, with a local sun rotating around the experiment is going to um, look exactly the same um, the the shadows the sun casts as it goes around are going to be exactly the same as if we were on a ball and um, the sun was 95 million miles away. It works out exactly the same. Is that something that's not quite flat? Is it like a bowl shape with yeah, a bump in the yeah, middle? Is that what you describe? This one's a little bit... Um, no, no, I'm talking... I was just using this as an example, but um, okay, I'll go back to my one so it doesn't confuse the issue. Yeah, because you still have to explain... Uh, I've seen the, the model, how the sun and the moon are opposite sides rotating around, and why does it get dark if the sun is always there on a flat Earth? Why does it uh, ever get dark? <laughs> because um, light doesn't travel infinitely, you know, whether that's an inherent property of light or it's just because we've got atmosphere, you know, with water vapour and dust and whatnot, which gradually filters the light out. Light doesn't travel indefinitely, so as the sun moves away from us, it gets dark. It's, it's as simple as that. Well, you know, when I'm, um, to respond to that, when my girlfriend was in China, I call her when the sun was setting there, and the sun was already rising, and she'd be 16 hours ahead. So she was seeing the sun coming up while I see it going down because she's on the other side of the planet, and, and the world's a rotating ball. How do you explain um, that on, when you're on some of the phone, it's dark on their side of the world, it's light just, here? Just, um, uh, just uh, stay with that thought. I'll go back to my flat Earth model just a second. Yeah, yeah. Let you present it, you know, systematically. I don't want to jump ahead too much. Okay, so. Um, as the sun goes around, it's only lighting up that patch there. So, um, hang on. So, you say China and North America. I'll stop the sun between the two. Uh, hang on, where's China? Oh, it's over here. <laughs> uh, so, it's kind of hard to see, but it's only lighting that patch there. So it works the same, basically. You can translate um, everything, the seasons, um, the days um, from the spherical model with a distant sun to a round flat model with a local orbiting sun. You can translate it and it works out pretty much the same. And for seasons, basically, what we've um, deduced is that the sun, um, this model shows it, but it takes a while. But in your winter, the sun is further out, so it's further away, so it's going to be heating you less, and the days are going to be shorter, and vice versa. Well, I guess an important important question there is um, what are your what are your sources? We've had big scientists since uh, Galileo, Copernicus, saying that the world is spherical. Like to me, it's um, a bunch of amateur video bloggers who present all this evidence. But well, what are your sources? Where's well, your scientific evidence? What yeah, scientists are back you up? This is scientific evidence. Well, not this one in particular, but everything 
all the experiments were done like um you know who says you need a phd to do science you know um it just takes well, you, you a, don't it, it just takes don't. common sense and um an inquisitive mind and i think the ancient greeks calculating the angle in the well in egypt and in greece that's just that's science that's logic it's geometry you, you measure it i mean yeah, so how we, do you refute we can that use, well i just have um you, the same applies that when you do the experiment and um, with the presupposition that the sun is small and local and orbiting, um, you get the same results. So, Okay, even if that's true, um, I guess the big question is, where are your sources? Who came up with the idea of a dome? Like, can you, um, there was a book in the 1800s, right? The Flat Earth Book. Is that what Eric Dubay uses? As yeah, his, I think it um, goes by that book. Most people um, sort of based it on Henry Robotham's work. Um, but, okay. Hang on, just drawing a blank for a second. Sources, basically. Um, Everybody for the last 500 years or so um, has w been working with the presupposition that um, we live on a ball and we live in infinite space and um, the model's been presented to people before they, you know, had the criti critical faculties to... Um, to challenge it. And, well, don't, um, don't forget Columbus. I, the, the story we're all taught as kids that Christopher Columbus discovered the world's round in 1492 when he discovered America, you know, that that, that we found if that was something empirical. We thought, well, that was real evidence. It wasn't something just presented to us. It's because Columbus discovered America. That's yeah, that's but, what we um, were all taught. How much do you, how much stock do you put in the official history that's been presented to you? Because the more I look into it, the more I find that has been oh, your sound just dropped off a bit. Can can um, you? How's your sound? You want to repeat that? Uh, the the more I look into history, the more it seems to me that it's been fabricated. And I think you know Christopher Columbus, if there was even such a guy, knew they knew um, that the you know there was they they basically had maps of the entire planet, and they'd probably been um, you know rounded up and they were only in the hands of you know the rich elite and they knew america was there well, yeah i agree that columbus art had maps with him when he came but that map is similar to our conventional map uh, of a of a round earth yeah but the so that, that would tip him off this right i think he did exactly i think columbus was a jew because in 1690 1492, they kicked the Jews out of Spain. He left at that time. That's another story. I think he was a real historical person, but I think the idea of him coming to yeah, America is, is completely uh, sound. Chris, Cristobal Colón was his real name. Um, and yeah, but obviously Europeans, you, know, you agree the Europeans across the Atlantic Ocean since 1490 came to America. That's true. But you're saying it's flat, and I'm, I'm saying that was evidence that the world yeah, was round. Well, okay. Um, but why is it necessarily evidence the world's round when you can, you know, Rather than um, rather than circumnavigating a globe, you're just going around in a circle. It, it works the same on either. And the cartographers of the day made all their maps with the presupposition that we're living on a globe. Um, but there's a bunch of different map predictions. You know, like this is just the as a muscle equidistant projection, which um, is used quite often in legitimate applications um there's just another map projection actually i know what i'll show you uh, it'll make it easier for you to sort of um envisage this photoshop that's what we need um okay i'll just um open up a standard mercator map in photoshop the mercator projection if i go to my photoshop filters um and then I edit. Yeah, sorry for the dead ear. Um, I'm a little bit nervous. This is the first time I've ever had to argue my case um, <laughs> formally like this. Yeah, I've done uh, hundreds of shows. Yeah, I've, I haven't done anything live like this. Um, okay, distort. Okay, so in Photoshop you've got a filter called polar coordinates. Um, 
So you go rectangular to polar. So what that does is basically wraps, um, so control Z, it wraps, uh, makes a, a point up there and basically um, moves the top edges into the middle and then wraps it around. Um, so then all I have to do is um, change that to a square and you've got the flat earth map. And what's more, um, I can go into 3D software and now just to show you, okay, dragging a texture onto the sphere and oh, and there we go. To, to me, that's that's not evidence. If you just go, go from this to that, that, that no, doesn't no, no. show any it, evidence it, to me. It's not actual evidence, but it's um, probably useful for people to envisage these things. You know, sort of. Thing. I mean, there's there's other points I could bring up. I don't I don't want to overwhelm you. Do you want to finish? I yeah, mean, I can bring oh, up no, other no, points. Next one, you... hey, I can't even remember where I was going with this. Okay. Well, one thing is um, um, when you flush the toilet. The water goes around in a circle, but in the southern hemisphere it goes the other way because the world's flat because one side is uh, closer yeah, to the equator, so one side is going faster than the other. Also, the pendulum, when you swing a pendulum back and forth like this, it actually goes off to the side a bit on the northern hemisphere, and in the southern hemisphere goes the other side because the world's round. I think that's sort of a myth, to be honest. I mean, I know the um, Coriolis effect is a myth. Um, Hey, where you are, you're in the southern hemisphere, aren't you? you know, like yeah, when you flush yeah. the toilet, does it go clockwise uh, or it, counterclockwise? It all depends on the toilet, you know. Like it, it depends on the <laughs> shape of the um, the bowl and the, you know, the direction the spouts of water. You know, like if you've got one clogged on the left side, maybe um, the water's going to come out a bit wonky and it'll go. Oh. But where do, how does it usually go when you you see the toilet flushing? You've done it a million times in your lifetime. It, it depends on the toilet, you know. Like I bet you could um, go around to all your friends' houses and you'll find that they don't all go in the same direction. That's in there. Well, what what's your experience though? Usually, what what do you, what do you see when you flush the toilet? Uh, I I can't even remember to be honest, but um, like well, for me, it's it's always it's clockwise. I always see it going clockwise all the time, all my life. I I would it would never see it going counterclockwise. I flush the toilet every day. I mean, what, what do you see? What's your experience? I mean, you've seen this a bazillion times in your I life, think it right? It's clockwise. I mean, do you really need to test right now? I thought you'd remember that. No, 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 because uh, I've long since um, debunked this whole Coriolis effect thing. Okay, so think about it. I mean, it like you this. can flush the toilet right now if you want and, no, and take no, a let, look and let um, me know. I don't mind. Let's think we... about it logically. <laughs> <laughs> it would only take a few seconds, right? Yeah, but, you know, I could lie. So, um, yeah, let, think, let's think about it logically. Um, why is Coriolis effect so selective? Like um, snipers, um, some of them, occasionally you'll get some that reckon they have to adjust due to the Coriolis effect. Um, they'll have to like aim slightly up or whatever, up or down or left or right. But if that was the case, um, planes wouldn't be able to land because the surface of the earth would be moving too fast, but you don't get that. Um, and what's more... Well, the, pla the plane's going relative to the earth. Like at the equator, we spin 1,000 miles an hour. Where I live in the 49th parallel, we spin about 500 miles an hour. But if a plane takes off, it's all relative. There's no difference. The earth and the plane are spinning at the same speed, so yeah, well, there would the same, be no difference. The same should be true for bullets, but, um, you know, some people say that you have to adjust the Cori Coriolis effect, but... It's a load of well, rubbish. what's what's the what's the Coriolis effect? What's that? Oh, oh that's um, the effect that causes um, the water. Well, supposedly causes the water to um, to twirl different ways in each he hemisphere. But um, see, I've looked into this, um, and it turns out that it's it's just not true. Well, you haven't been able to answer what time, what, how does the, do your toilet flush? I mean, I'll take your word for it. I mean, it's Hang always on. clockwise. Yeah, I've seen I, in the I'm Northern Hemisphere, sure it's I, always I'm clockwise. Sure usually... Unless you go to a restaurant and they have a jet propulsion or something in a certain way, but just naturally, See, I, I it's seem always to recall clockwise, clockwise my entire life. Well. I, I seem to recall clockwise as well. 
Yours is clockwise? I, that's what I always thought. I mean, that's what I think in my mind. But, you know, now that I think about it, it's like, uh, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, the the actual physics of it is the, it's called the Coriolis effect. And it's the same principle. If, if that is true, then um, when a plane takes off, um, the Earth should be moving under the plane, and you know, as you get closer to the equator, it should be moving faster. Um, so at the equator, it turns out that the Earth should be moving at about a thousand miles per hour. So yeah, that's right. But the plane takes off at a thousand miles an hour, so it's all yeah, relative. But, uh, can can I just hold for a second? I just want to stop my recording. Do you want Do you want to take a break, like get a glass of water or anything? Um, I'm I'm going to go flush my toilet. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we'll take a break right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm recording. I'm back. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So my toilet. It turns out that um, you can't tell via the flush. I think maybe it works but a bit. Different. You like can't that. tell. It, um, it doesn't. It does go in a circle at all. No, nah, it doesn't fully drain like that. It basically, um, it sort of drains all at once, then fills up. But I did fill my hand basin, and yeah. fixed that, and it went clockwise. So yeah, there goes. It went that clockwise. Theory. It did. Well, I, I guess the world's flat then. It must mm -hmm. be flat then. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, um, it seems to me that that test is pretty arbitrary because there's so many other factors that can um, influence, the, you know, like the shape of the bowl and the, um, the direction that the water is going into it, you know. it's Okay. Well, I, I could ask other questions. There's more profound questions like... Um, um, like last night, I saw the eclipse of the moon, and the ancient Greeks, they determined that the world's spherical, because when the shadow of the earth falls on the moon, the shadow is always round, like the round ball, the shadow is always round, but if you have a flat plate, the shadow could be a line, or it could be round, depending on how you tilt the plate. Yeah, but the yeah. ancient Greeks knew that a ball always leaves her. So I saw this last night. We had January 31st. We had the eclipse of the moon. And you see the shadow, the round shadow coming over the moon. So that indicates that the Earth is a sphere well, casting a shadow. Only, only if, and the ancient Greeks knew that 26 centuries ago. Yeah, but again, they went from the supposition that it's, well, two um, assumptions. Number one, that the Earth is a ball, and number two, that it is the shadow of the Earth that we're seeing on the Moon. And um, Well, that, that just seems to be the physical evidence. If you hold up two balls of light, it's not like they had a supposition. That's just what they saw. That's well, just that, that's raw what, data, right? That's what they assumed, but, um, you know, flat Earthers have been looking into that as well, and it turns out that the angles are all wrong, that between the Sun and the Earth and the Moon, um, like... Uh, yeah, the angles are wrong. They, the Earth can't be causing that shadow. And it seems that there's another body up there, um, which they're calling Rahu. And, um, you know, the general consensus at the moment is that it's the shadow of Rahu that you're seeing on the moon. But um, when I was out there at 5 a.m., the Earth is uh, the Sun is directly on the other side of the Earth, casting a shadow. According to the laws of physics, and, and the, the time of the the Sun is before sunrise. It's entirely logical the Sun was on the other side of the world, uh, casting a shadow, which fell on the Moon. I mean, doesn't that make sense? Um, yeah, it makes sense if you're working from the assumption that we're living on a ball. But you know, for for all these supposed um, proofs of uh, of a globe, um, there's other possible reasons, you know, and it's like people have grown up with um, with all these supposed facts, and um, it, you know, it's been drilled into us all our lives. So you, you think that, well, um, that's the only reason. So that's what it is. But there's, well, you get to tell us about Ra Rahu. Who's who's Ra Rahu? Um, who's Rahu? I haven't looked into this in depth, so let me just quickly Google it. Oh, I'm pretty sure there's some YouTube videos on it. Uh, I mean, my, my question would be, what's the or, origination of Rahu? Who came up with this? When was this discovered? Was this in the book in the 1800s? Is, uh, what's the source? Like, what's the source material? That's an important thing, right? 
Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Like, like with a scientific experiment, they can show you how it works, and you can re repeat the experiment, right? Okay, um, let's like with, with the eclipse, we can explain that. So you need to show us some sources here, huh? <laughs> It's too big for me to um, look into everything. And for me, like, uh, I've proved to myself that living on a giant flying ball is impossible in a few different ways. Like, the the total lack of curvature is a big one. And um, the fact that it's impossible to have a pressurized system like the atmosphere of the Earth next to a vacuum is another one. And... Like that, this is simple physics, simple science, reproducible um, and undeniable. And these two facts alone mean that we're going to have to start again. And that's what we're doing. So um, you can fire as many supposed proofs of the globe at me and I can do my best to debunk them. But if you can't debunk, you know, um, yeah, like I said, the fact is I've I've looked into it for a long time, and you know, I you said about about two and a half years. You said I right? didn't go into it thinking that we were gonna like. I thought I'd debunk it and move on. And the fact that um, the flat Earth subject is still huge and it's getting bigger and it's getting bigger. That's what concerns me. That's why that I take it seriously. It. People believe it. I feel I have to address it. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't believe um, it, but I take it seriously that this is. No, I feel it's an international Jewish conspiracy to confuse us and make, and make us maybe look dumb. But you can explain Rahu. Like, if you've been conflict. studying this for two and a half years, you should know what Rahu is. I mean, two and a half years you've studied this long time, you should be able to back this up. So well, tell I, us about Rahu. Are I'm you saying of, that what, what we when we see it, this is a lunar, a solar eclipse, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I, I mean, obviously, that's the sun there with the moon in front of it. So you're saying Rahu is another body? It's not the yeah, moon? Yeah, I think so. But like this, I, I've stopped looking into this, you know, like um, like you said, and I agree with you, this whole thing was rolled out to discredit truthers because most people just find it utterly ridiculous. And those that do look into it, there's no going back, you know, when you figure out... Um, when you do the test, the curvature test yourself and figure that but, out. Um, just to no back up back. a bit, aren't you contradicting yourself? You say you agree with me that this has been rolled out to discredit us, or they're flat earth discrediting us, and yet if you think it's true, then truth is truth, and it's good to say the truth. If you think it's true, <laughs> then uh, well, it seems that, like you're contradicting yourself. Well, no, I mean, they brought it out um, probably at the highest level, knowing full well that it, it's true. But knowing full well that most people are, aren't even going to look into it, they're just going to think it's ridiculous because of a lifetime of programming and because we've got this um, model that has undergone like, you know, 500 years, 2,000 years of, um, they've had that long to come up with the, um, the model and you know, adjust their calculations over the millennia to fit the observations. And it's very convincing, you know. Um, yeah. And I've been convinced of it my whole life up to a couple of years ago. But Well, I agree with you that most people will reject this without looking. I've spent, without looking to it, but I have spent at least 10 hours, you know, watching these videos patiently. Uh, the Eric Dubé has won 200 reasons why the Earth's flat. I mean, I would watch this kind of stuff, and I Yeah, I and don't that, that was it. a crappy video. <laughs> but I agree with you, most people won't take this seriously. Yeah, that, see, Eric Dubé, that 200 um, reasons video was terrible. That was one of the first that I watched, and um, I was sort of on the fence at that time. Like, I was thinking, oh. um, it's... You know, I'm going to have to look into this more. But a lot of the proofs that he shows in that is like, nah, nah, that's just rubbish, you know. And that's even as a as a flat earther now, um, I look back at that and it's like, you know, that's just going to, um, you know, it, that's why I think that he probably is a plant and... Um, you know, the the first three big flat earth YouTubers, I think, were all, um, I mean, I could be wrong, um, of course, but I think they're all agents, you know. I think they were, 
um, rolled out to get this thing started. And can you say who are the best ones besides yourself, of course? Who are the best ones on YouTube with really good sources on the flat Earth that you'd recommend? Well, the thing is, you keep asking for sources, but this is something that you've got to look into yourself and. Um, yeah, but I need sources to look well, into, well, <laughs> right? Like if, if if I want to say tell people that Adolf Hitler was not what we've been told, I would give them sources. I'd recommend you know, Dennis Wise's video, Adolf Hitler, the greatest story ever told, and I would give I would give lists of sources. Yeah, well, all the sources so far are people that have just been looking into it for the last few years, and but the thing is, it's um, reproducible science. You know, that's what it's pretty much all based on, and um, you don't need a letters after your name or a degree or whatever to to do solid um, science. Um, well, I agree. Some of the greatest discoveries in science came from people who didn't even work in those fields, like Louis Pasteur and others. I, yeah. I agree with that. And that's the problem, you know. They've got everybody thinking that um, this stuff is too complicated for the average goyim to figure out. Um, and the goyim! The, the, <laughs> We're the, the goyim! <laughs> The experts have already got it figured out, so they must know better. But when, you know, like I said, I did Astronomy 101 at university and loved it. And I figured out, um, you know, I got my head around everything they taught. And But looking back on that, you know, it's based on some assumptions that I can prove wrong myself. And when you... Um, prove some of these wrong it all falls apart you know like um but can, can you finish you haven't really explained raul you're saying there's this is not the moon in front of the sun you're saying there's a second body that yeah, blocks the that, sun i think that's what it is um i mean i what i really need is like a two minute video that we can play if you want that's fine but um I think this is one of those things you're going to have to look into yourself um, because I haven't looked into it that deeply. And well, at least the, the audience, this is for the audience benefit. They can yeah, go to that yeah. video. They can look it up if they want, sure. Yeah. But, um, you know, like I said, um, I've proven to my own satisfaction that the um, – Heliocentric um, infinite space ball Earth model is impossible, and I've done it using reproducible solid science. Okay, but it does raise other more profound questions. For instance, uh, how did the dome get there? Who built the dome? Was it God? Yeah, well, it seems to be, you know, and the fact that um, all these different um, cultures had pretty much a flat earth, um, a round plane with a dome over it cosmology for thousands of years up until about the 1600s. Um, oh yeah, this is something we need to cover. Um, like, yeah, some Greek philosophers had been toying with the, um, the ball earth model, um, but it wasn't until the 1600s when the Jesuits pretty much took over the Catholic Church that um, it started to be, you know, the Catholic Church started to accept it and um, they sent out, um, uh, what do you call it, missionaries, Jesuit missionaries um, far and wide and they set up universities and basically, I think in a lot of cases by force, um, uh, you know, over probably a couple of generations enforced this model, you know, like they um, they, they taught their astronomy, like they were big on astronomy. And yeah, but the, the Jesuits never conquered the entire planet. Like how do they, uh, how the Japanese and the Chinese teach that the world's round, right? Uh, like well, uh, well, what about well, Africa? What about the Africans? What about South on. America? Bear with me, bear with me. Um, See, China held out the longest, you know, like um, they, I think until like the late 1800s, pretty much um, went by this type of cosmology. And um, 
Well, they're Buddhist. The Buddhists are the world spherical. China was a Buddhist country. I think you're wrong about that. Um, I think that um, the version that you've been given of Buddhist cos cosmology is post-Jesuit indoctrination. You know, like they. No, I'm like, calling the, the Pali Suttas is the authentic record of the the Buddha. Like we we don't agree with Mahayana, like Tibetan or Zen, because Theravada, like scholars all over the world would agree, Theravada is a more accurate original teachings of the Buddha, and it's 6,000 pages long, it's written in Pali. You could argue about the translation of the word, did it mean spherical or round? You could argue that. But translations I've read said spherical. I mean, it's something we could easily Google, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's not my um, forte. It's not my strong point, but... Um, well, it is my forte. You know, I've been a Buddhist teacher for 20 years. <laughs> That's what we always taught. Yeah, but we're, um, we're proud. But, we're proud but, that what, the two thousand years before Columbus, we're proud that Buddha said the world was spherical. Yeah, but how do you know that the um, that what you've been taught and what you're teaching isn't a revised version um, post um, post Jesuit missionary Jesuit universities? Oh, well, that's lots of evidence to establish that. Even in the first two centuries, Buddhism was split off in different lineages, and their records are almost identical. Like the Savasti Varden School, the Theravadan School, we've a, even ancient extinct schools. We've got their their scriptures, and they're virtually identical from very early centuries. The Jes Jesuits were until two thousand years after the Buddha. Well, I'm thinking that you know um, the interpretation that you're going by, um, like maybe um, because all the Buddhist models I've looked at. Um, they're pretty much flat earth models with um, with other realms and the heavens and um, you know. Well, yeah, I meant the Buddha. He did mention Mount Meru. Of course, we would argue that Tibetans, Mahayanas have changed the scriptures that they're wrong. <laughs> anyway, so the Theravada is the authentic word. And then you'd have to argue from there. But it's fine to just say that you don't agree with the Buddha. You think the Buddha's wrong. You, you could say that as well. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'll say that then. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay. I, I actually think that. Um, yeah, like I said, you're getting a revised edition because um, I think the Jesuits responsible were responsible for a lot of book burnings and you know a revision of history, basically. You know, and the Jesuits. But they, um, they never got a hold of China. Like Chairman Mao got in there, but all of China and Japan and Korea and Vietnam yeah. and Thailand, the Jesuits never had the control like they, over they, those they, well, countries. You're not okay. saying that, are you? You control you control the educational systems via the universities, which is what they did. They set up universities in China. They first, I think, um, you know, they went in there under the guise of converting them to Christianity and then, um, you know, set up um, learning institutions which became universities and they were real big into astronomy and they probably, um, you know, just slowly but surely, but maybe by force, I don't know. Um, yeah, but are, you saying, are you saying that Jesuits Jez pretty much conquered Burma? Thailand, Sri Lanka, Mongolia, well, Tibet, they, China. They, the Jesuits conquered all those no, countries. Is that your claim, they, Robbie? They, no, no, no. They, you don't have to conquer a country. It's like um, I've got this other um, video, which I think you will find quite interesting um, because... I don't like, mean conquer, but you think they had they enough can. influence to change all yeah, of Asian yeah, yeah. culture, to well, change well, their scriptures, well, which they've had for 2,500 years, the Jesuits could change history like that? Um, I think so, yeah. Like, um, there's pretty good evidence that a lot of Chinese history is fabricated. Um, this Russian um, historian called Anatoly Fomenko goes into that, and I haven't looked into it as much as I would like to, but... Um, well, you know, Buddhism is in dozens of countries. I mean, did the Jesuits get control of uh, all the Buddhist countries no, and all the education systems? You, you've already admitted in your own videos that the Jews have um, infiltrated Buddhism, right? Jesuits are crypto-Jews. Um, so hang on, just, I'm just trying to find this um, video. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm saying that the Jews have infiltrated Buddhism in the West. I'm not saying they've controlled it in Asia. Yeah. 
Like I understand from the Jesuit argument. My point is that it's limited. Their their influence could only be limited, and not the entire planet. I think, um, like, outwardly, um, they're, they're so subversive. Like, okay, the the Jews expelled at least a hundred times from various countries and city, cities for engaging in and carrying out subversive political plots against humanity to advance their own cause. And the Jesuits expelled from at least 80 times from various countries and cities and whatnot um, for basically the same reasons. Um, and the Jesuit oath is basically straight out of the Talmud. Um, and you know, you can look into the history of the Jesuits, their converse, the original, like um, the first head of the Jesuits was um, Ignatius Loyola, who was a, a Basque Jew, um, a converso. Like basically, they were given the option during the Inquisition, Spanish Inquisition, to either convert to Judaism or, I mean, to Catholicism or... Yeah, I agree. I they, agree with all that, that they're Jewish, infiltrated Jewish control. Yeah, I basically yeah, yeah. agree with what you're saying. So, yeah. so you know how subversive and sneaky and subtle they have always been, you know? They oh, yeah. This get their profound, greasy fingers. And they're into, a worthy opponent, the international yeah, and, Jews. They're a and, very worthy opponent. They have profound it took you, power over our very perception of reality itself. And Exactly, exactly. It took pretty much your whole life to figure that out. So um, how would you took know? It took me 52 years. took me 52 years to wake up. Yeah, I think me... in terms of my Buddhist awakening, that's part of my Buddhist awakening is waking up to the Jewish reality. Yeah, it took me 35 years, I guess. Um, and, but, you know, that, they're that sneaky. They're that good at it. And I've been practicing it for, you know, thousands of years since, like, Babylon, probably. So that's how. But so um, I feel you're, you're really not making a point here about the flat earth. We both agree um, on the Jews and the Jesuits have some control. I'm just saying I think the Jesuits have limited, and I think everyone would agree, the evidence in the, in the, the Jesuits have limited influence over all of Asian thinking. I think um, probably a whole lot more than you would realize Um well, I'd maybe, have, maybe, but I would, I would say it's not of, all pervasive. I would have to do a bit of Googling um, because I, yeah, I should have looked into this more. Um. Well, for future debates, maybe be even more, <laughs> more well-armed. I could ask more profound questions, but I'll let you finish what you do. Yeah, Jesuit um, China missions, okay. <laughs> The missionary efforts and other work of the Society of Jesus or Jesuits between the 16th and 17th century played a significant role in continuing the transmission of knowledge, science and culture between China and the West and influenced Christian culture in Chinese society today. So this is Wikipedia. So, um, you know, they, they went and, um, did, you know, basically... Um, uh, uh, lambs, wolves disguised as lambs. You know, they go in and like all holy and religious. And yeah, I, I agree with that. And like um, now, the fact that they're Christ crypto Jews, um, sneakily and subversively, they and slowly they've got time on their side. They you know, start up schools under the guise of charity and eventually they grow to universities and they've got the um, the persua persuasive, um, like, uh, they've got astronomy on their side, you know, they've got the first telescopes and they've got this model that it's already sort of semi-engineered and pretty convincing. And well, yeah, you could argue that. But I'm getting back, not to beat the Buddhist example too much, but 50 BC, the Buddhist scriptures were first written down because it's an oral tradition in, in Sri Lanka, they wrote it down. We've got pretty much a hard copy, which has been recopied since 50 BC. So the, if Jesuits went to China, you know, 
1,500 years later, still it doesn't negate that we've had a, a copy of the Buddha saying the world's spherical going back, you know, 2,500 years or 2,000 years. Yeah, well, I'd uh, have, it supersedes the, the Jesuits. I, I'd have to um, read um, the, you know, what you've read and, um, you know, do, do some more looking into it because yeah, basically, it's, it's common Buddhist knowledge. Though I mean, any Buddhist teacher weeks, would know this kind of stuff. In the last couple of weeks, I've, yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, they have got the the whole story you know um okay yeah from your perspective we can argue that i mean we can move on to other points i was going to ask you more profound questions yeah do it um when we look at the moon it looks round we look at mars it looks round and you look at jupiter you can actually see i've seen with my naked eye the four moons of jupiter through a telescope Everything looks round yeah. and spherical. So why wouldn't the Earth be? Well, you're arguing the Earth does look spherical, but it's flat with a dome. Well, okay. yeah, but, you know, just because these things in the sky are spheres doesn't mean that the Earth is the same as one of these things in the sky, you know. Like, um, before the, um, the, the planets were formerly called wandering stars, and um, the stars are luminaries. I was hoping you'd get to this, and I've forgotten about it. But, um, okay, so check... Yeah, let's talk about the planets and, yeah, yeah. how do you explain, like, Jupiter and Saturn? We've known about these for a few centuries. Neptune, <coughs> Pluto, Mars, yeah, well, <laughs> Venus, we've, Mercury. We've, we've grown up thinking that they're solid um, planets, you know, but um, when you start looking into it, uh, they're just not, you know, like, this is actual footage of the stars and planets, Um people have taken from this is like uh, the flat earth um, camera of choice is the Nikon P900 because I think it's got like a 60 times zoom um, so yeah here's some footage wow of what, what's that Mars cool And, you know, this is, um, a lot of people have been shooting these videos, you know. That seems a bit like cherry picking. You see it from a distance of the light, but we've had much more close-up photos of Mars, right? With more powerful <clears throat> telescopes from Earth, you can see more detail of Mars than that. Yeah, but most of those are through NASA. And, um, but not all, though. We have big, powerful telescopes in South America, other <laughs> countries like Russia, the other people, like NASA's the United States. How do you explain the Russian Space Agency? Oh, hang on, Sue. Um, yeah, well, uh, I think Russia has long since been like the Hegelian dialectic. Um, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the, the boogeyman of the day, but it's all like Hegelian Dialect, yeah, I, I agree. Like, um, it's um, controlled opposition. The Rothschilds control yeah, both sides. Yeah. I agree with that, actually. That's but right. think about it. Remember my, my dad, when his father died, he left him enough money to buy a telescope. So my dad buy a telescope. Your average person can just get a powerful telescope and look at Mars. How do you explain that? Anyone in the world can get a telescope and look at Mars. What, what do you yeah, say about that? It, it, does, it still doesn't look like a big sphere you know it just looks like a blurry um we can look at um mars through an actual telescope um well i i saw here the planetarium in vancouver so about, about 12 blocks from my apartment remember mars was a bit closer to the world about 10 years ago and i, I looked through the telescope on mars I, I saw mars it looked bigger and i mean it looks spherical to me i mean i think you <clears> can <throat> see mars like the video showed us is this poor quality at a distance it's like cherry picking evidence it seems you know no nah, no nah, um Uh, I'm not going to convince you with this, and there's just too much to go through. But um, well, camera, yeah, that's not a convincing <laughs> image. You get it? What yeah, a well, cell phone um, camera of Mars no, no, going by? No, no, it's not a cell phone I mean, camera. This is it's a, shady. I mean, that we have more phone, powerful telescopes than that, right? Not a cell phone camera. This is like a a good camera with excellent lenses. Um, and look, okay, that one was a whole lot clearer. 
but um, it basically looks like um, they're in the waters above in the um, you know the Christian model you've got the form firmament which separates the waters above from the waters below and um, all these um, pictures they they look like it's taken through water and um, so yeah here's another one and yeah I understand the argument with the dome that there's a layer of water Michael Talger says that is water above the dome, a layer of water above the dome. That's the story, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the thing is, um, in the modern era, like uh, when telescopes get beyond a certain price range in size, they become digital. They've got, uh, this sounds ridiculous, but, uh, you know, look into it. They've got pre-programmed images that they show it seems for hey that's ridiculous <laughs> yeah, i know i know but um you know but how do you explain 50 years ago before the digital time people had telescopes then and you could see well you could see it, venus mercury you could see it's got rocks you get you could see mars it's got rocks it, on it through through a normal telescope that anyone can get their hands on they just looked like um blurry sort of balls um but, okay, Jesuit infiltration of, um, Jesuits basically have owned astronomy um, since day one, you know, since um, they sort of spread, started spreading this. They've, I think observatories are pretty much Jesuit run and they show what they want through their telescopes, it seems. You know, like, well, um, I, I will admit that the Hubble telescope is not allowed to focus on the moon because the moon is a, another alien secret. They don't want us to know the truth about the moon. I'll admit that much. Yeah, well, the Hubble telescope is actually, um, I think it's in a plane. and um, It's not a balloon, it's in a plane? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the, I, I can't um, show you off the top of my head, but there's been... This dude did a video. He looked into it very thoroughly. He was he was on the phone with NASA in this video, and it was proven conclusively that the Hubble telescope is not orbiting the Earth. It's actually this telescope called Sophia. Um, I'll show you an image of that, which is in a plane. Yeah, that's the. So that is the Hubble telescope. The pictures we get of it are just fairy tales. Uh, how did they explain that photo? Go, the photo. I mean, they're not admitting that's a Hubble telescope, are they? No, but um, if you watch this documentary, I'll be able to find it for you if you watch it right through it. Um, well, I should mention for the audience, you can put anything you want in the description below this video, any sources you want. We have a couple of pages of descriptions, so whatever you want to put for, for yeah, the audience to yeah, see, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll watch it through, and um, yeah, because all these points where I've sort of got stuck, it's like, I know I've got, you know, crazy amounts but, of <laughs> stuff. But that, that doesn't showing. convince me, if I, if I see a plane going by with that that doesn't convince me that's the hubble telescope yeah yeah, yeah. What, what i'm <laughs> saying is else. you have to watch this video which um you know it, it documents um it's a phone call i can't even remember who it's with but it basically documents this guy figuring out he shows all the sources figuring out that the hubble telescope is actually or well, you know the it, it's the sophia telescope um See, and this thing brings me back to my original supposition that it's just a bunch of amateur video makers telling us since the year 2015 that the world's flat. You don't yeah, see but, scientists or people at universities. Well, you don't, you don't, don't see mainstream. But a bunch of don't. amateur bloggers on YouTube. That's yeah, what, that's but, my impression. You know, why why is our word any? Why does it carry any less weight? You know, you can look well, at it's evidence. It's you can look evidence. Into every, everything that I've shown you here, and you can pretty much prove it for yourself you know like the most important things that the flat earth movement is based on you can prove it for yourself you and it's not that complicated you don't need well, um well i would say you haven't proven it to me i would say you haven't 
That's <laughs> because you haven't like another thing though. Another you haven't big, taken the time to is, get your head around it. Yet. What is the nature of the galaxies and the universe and the Big Bang and the whole rest of the universe? Are you changing the entire universe? Yep. Yeah, totally. Um, the whole the whole model falls apart when you start looking at it critically. Like, uh, well, that's that, pretty big. Now we've now we've lost the entire universe with uh, you know billions of galaxies and trillions of stars. We we've yeah, lost it all yeah, now. Yeah, the whole universe. Huge. So tell that's us huge. tell us about the whole universe now. Well, basically, the whole universe is based on. Um, I've got a video that covers this, but it doesn't cover it thoroughly. Yeah, sure you um, do. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Um, the experiment that, okay, you need, um, it's all based on formulas and mathematics. Um, it's not based on actual observation. It's basically, that's basically how it's all come about. So, like, if at some point you have um, something, you know, one step of the, um, process if there's a mistake somewhere at the start it all falls apart and we've found that mistake we've found a lot of mistakes but um okay you need um the formula for gravity big g is basically what the whole model is built around and when you look into how they came about this formula it's just ridiculous you know like this dude did an experiment which basically hasn't been reproduced ever. Oh, I just want to comment on the planes you're looking at here. Uh, they would have to fly it in the dark at night to be the telescope to, to see stars, right? This is a picture of planes during the day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no doubt. But, um, yeah, yeah. See, um, it, it, like I said, like I've said a few times, it's taken me years to figure all this stuff out and it's been a gradual process you know and i don't claim and nor does anyone else that we have all the answers but the proof that we do have that the um the conventional heliocentric model just doesn't work is massive but i feel all these years you've wasted your time robbie <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah we all have, we all have. And, you know, it's, it's, that's why it's so hard for people to admit, even when they're shown evidence like I've been showing you, you know. Well, it's, it's not convincing evidence, so you haven't, no, uh, you, you, haven't, you, haven't convinced, you haven't really answered my objection. The, the lack of curvature should be, you know, if you look into this for yourself, I mean, obviously you're going to have to verify that all these formulas that were fused. Yeah, but you have to explain correct. things like the dome, and you're saying there's water no, above the dome. No, I mean, if, if you look at the sky, I, there's I've no said, water in the I've, way. I've said a bunch of times we don't have to explain that. We've got, um, we've thoroughly disproven the heliocentric model, and we've got a starting point, and we're going to figure all that out. But um, Yeah, but if, the, if there's holes in the story, like... Like, if you look at the star, the clear sky at night, there's no water in your way. You can see the moon very clearly, the face of the moon. There's no body of water yeah, in the yeah. way. Yeah, I think the firmament is between, um, like, further out. Oh, yeah, you're the saying moon. the moon's on the inside and the yeah, water's yeah, outside. Yeah, the, the okay. sun and the moon, yeah. What about the stars? The stars are on the inside of the dome as well, right? The points uh, of I light? It, it seems like they're um, across this invisible barrier. Um, that's what it seems. And for for pretty much all of eternity they've been called the luminaries and they haven't been thought of as giant balls of gas floating in this impossible infinite vacuum they've just been i think people um in a lot of different cultures have thought of them as the souls of um dead people or something along those lines or the angels you know like um and the um in the Christian narrative, you've got the fallen angels that fell to earth, you know, um, maybe they were stars, maybe, you know, the realm of the heavens is probably beyond our comprehension because it's heavenly, you know, it's the realm of God. Yeah, but, but your, your explanation, though, are the stars' lights painted on the dome? There's a dome, there's lights on the dome, that explains stars? We can't know. We, you know, we, we, like I say, that video I showed you before of the 
footage um, people have been taking of stars, a lot of people have been getting the same results and, you know, you can dismiss it just by looking at that video, but you've really got to... Well, what are they? If, if there are, there's a dome. If there's a dome, you're saying that the lights are on the dome? Um, probably beyond the dome, but I don't know. I don't, I don't think we can ever really know how how it all works. I don't think we're supposed to know, you know. It's probably... Well, then, then we would probably just revert... beyond our comprehension. But why, why can't we just revert to our conventional thinking that there's an atmosphere and there's stars out there? And that we can't explain everything. Our conventional explanation, everything does hold together. I feel. Well, yeah. Like I said, it took me a long time of looking into all this and proving it for myself that it doesn't. And you know, I'm not going to convince you in a one-hour interview. And I didn't. Hey, hey, we. Why don't we ask the um, audience for a vote? And they, they can say on it here, who won the debate? Did Brian Rue win the debate or did Robbie win the debate? Who won? So so people leave, leave comments underneath. We can ask them to, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to yeah, comment sure. on that. And I'll post yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, my view hasn't changed. I'm still saying, I would call this video, uh, the earth is, is still not flat. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't really expect to convince you, but um, look into um, everything I've been showing you. You know, you probably won't, but... Um, Look well, I've already it. spent um, 10 hours um, watching these videos. I feel I should you know, get on with more important things. And, I've already and decided you didn't even true, figure so. out the curvature formula. The formula that you were using for that was the formula for a straight line, for God's sake. Okay, okay. You're right. I'll, I'll take the time to figure out the curvature formula. I'll, I, I'm obligated to study that because you did show me a chart there. That's fair enough. So I'll, I'll, I'll study that. I'll take yeah. some time. I yeah. promise and, you that. And look into <laughs> and think about the concept of having an atmosphere adjacent to a vacuum because it's impossible. Okay, yeah. So my, my gravity <laughs> theory, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll look into that. That's fair enough. Yeah. I wonder if there's any, I guess the, the big universe, that's a, an upsetting thing to people to tell them that, sorry, you know, other planets, galaxies, universe. So yeah. you're, are you saying that there's other, other planets in the universe also that are flat? Um, the dawn. No, 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 no. You've got to completely d dismiss all of that. Like, there's probably other realms. Like, maybe we can call them other dimensions, or maybe, um, like, the Buddhist map that I showed you, um, this one here, maybe... Beyond, yeah, the continents beyond the, beyond the flat. Yeah, yeah. Even definitely. beyond Antarctica, the Antarctica wall, you're saying there's other continents beyond that. Could be, could be. Yeah. Yeah, so what happens if you get in a plane? Let's say you get a 737 jet and you fly over the ice wall of Antarctica. Where does the plane go? Um, well, nobody, um, well, no civilian has been able to do that. But um, Admiral Byrd, um, this is another big part of the sort of conventional flat earth narrative. Um, just after World War II, um, Admiral Byrd, an American guy, um, was sent on a mission to Antarctica and I think this was in response to a group of Nazis who had escaped there quite possibly. Yeah, I'm very familiar it. with that story. Yeah, yeah I'm very yeah. familiar with that. 1947. Yeah, and basically, um, you know, he came back and he was on this legendary um, talk show called The Long Jeans Chronicles and he said, that beyond Little America, which is their base, um, there is a landmass um, the size of North America or the, of the U.S. So, size of the size of the United States, he said. Yeah, I saw that yeah, video. Yeah. There's a video on YouTube of that talk. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe I know. I don't know whether we can believe him, but um, after that, basically they started doing. Um, nuclear tests in Antarctica, and you know a lot of um, flat earthers have been theorizing that that was to they they found the dome. They went to Antarctica and found the dome, and they wanted to see if they could blast through it because like instantly the air might leak out leak out if they do that. It's kind of dangerous. The yeah, air can leak it, out. It seems foolish <laughs> to me. It seems you know, but, but this is the military we're talking about, but um. And Antarctica since then was quarantined, you know, like civilians can't get there unless it's under, like, very strict supervision. Yeah, I know that. 
But when when he's just get back and he said there's um you go halfway you go to the South Pole and the other side is larger than the United States. Well, that's true. If you look at a spherical model of the world, the continent of Antarctica, it is larger than the United States. But so what? I mean, couldn't they just fly a plane? I know the argument is planes don't fly over Antarctica, but they do fly over the North Pole. So people wonder, well, why don't planes fly over Antarctica? Maybe there's a military reason, but that doesn't make the world flat just because planes don't oh, fly yeah, over. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I agree with that. You know, just I was just um, spouting out some, uh, you know, some flat Earth stuff for you, and I agree that the landmass that he was talking about could just be Antarctica. But the way he says it, it seems like. Um, I can't even remember specifically how he said it. So, yeah, there's no point in getting into it at the moment. Um, yeah, I guess so. And this map we're looking at here, you know, this um, was this world map made 10 centuries ago. I mean, that, this is not really evidence. Somebody puts a map together no, like no, that. No, I mean, no, of course. I mean, an artist could do that. I mean, that's not what we but, would call evidence, right? Yeah, if you, you know, this, this is like, I don't think any um, anyone in the so-called flat earth community is, is saying um, straight out that this has to be real and then this is proof, but it's pretty interesting. Um, I'll say that for it, but it was found um, in Honolulu by a Japanese doctor called Dr. Kobayashi who um, said it belonged to his Buddhist brother, I think. Um, according to a letter, the original map was bought from China by a Buddhist priest and concealed in this temple. So, yeah, that that's all we got, and it's pretty hard to verify. So, yeah, <laughs> but it's yeah. interesting, you know. We got like, a, I I could talk for days um, and show you all this stuff, the circumstantial evidence, um, and you know, obviously, you can say, well, oh, that doesn't prove anything. That doesn't prove anything. But when you look at it all, look at it all, and start forming a big picture, um, yeah, it, it all just starts to fall into place. And basically, since I've been looking into this, all the questions I've had have been slowly being answered. You know, to I want to ask about the, you mentioned the flat Earth, you know, community. I guess it's growing since 2015. I discovered this. It must be growing, I would assume, right on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because you know, there's just well, okay, it's, if there wasn't something to I got it, friends, I got friends. Away. Like, um, if, you know, if it had been, um, like, uh, properly debunked by now, um, I'm pretty sure that we would have just discarded it, you know. I mean, I've got um, nothing invested in this. I mean, I've got some time invested in it, but if if anyone was to find conclusive proof that we lived on a globe, you know, if anyone was to disprove um, the um, the lack of curvature with some proper proof, this thing would have gone away, but it hasn't. Well, I, I believe that you're a true see, truth seeker. I think you just want to know the truth. I don't think you have an agenda. I don't think you're trying to lie. Yeah, and there's millions of people like me who, um, you know, have got over the hurdle um, and, uh, you know, some very smart people. I bet there are some, um, you know, Scientists. I would say at least six friends that I know personally of mine are, are flat earthers or, yeah. or, or, or some are all the way flat earthers, some part way there. But how many in the world, I guess you have any idea how many people in the world are flat earthers? Has anyone ever done an estimate? Yeah, I don't know how you'd find that out because the movement pretty much started on YouTube and um and the reason that makes me suspicious. So I'll start on YouTube. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, me like I said, I I agree. I I'm suspicious about it as well. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't something to it. You know. But does that mean uh, all the university professors in the world are part of a conspiracy, and NASA is no, part of no, a no, they conspiracy? No, no, they don't be because it's all compartmentalized, and um, you know, basically. It all comes down to misinterpretation of data, you know. Like, um, well, what about NASA though? NASA would have would have to be part of a massive conspiracy uh, with all only, the rockets going up in space. At the very top level, like um, you know, we've looked into all this and figured it out. Like um, 
it's so compartmentalized at NASA. Like the people making the bits and pieces of rockets and telescopes and satellites and whatever, they don't they, they know the specific part they're working on and what it's for, but often they don't even know the ultimate application of it, you know. It's yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you completely there. That's how they fake the moon landing. Only a few people at the top really had to know. That's true. I yeah, agree yeah. with that. So just extrapolate that out to everything that NASA does. And it's, it's not that big a stretch, you know. And as far as the uh, um, professors and learning institutions and whatnot, um, so I've been working from the supposition um, since, you know, forever, like, uh, and I've been presented with what is on the surface a very sound theory, and by the time that they reach um, tenure, um, they have so much invested in it that you really think a um, professor of astrophysics is going to even look into flat Earth? Of course they're not. Um, well, I mean, they would they would just refute it. They would say, "Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll just refute it." That's probably what they would say. Yeah, but they've been going about it um, with um, with their models, which are all based on false assumptions from from way back. So, um, yeah, like I said, when you've got so much invested in it in the model, everything like the foundations of astrophysics um, is based on these, well, it's basically based on the big G formula, um, which was, which uh, was came, that, that came about from this experiment, um, can't remember the name of the guy, um, but he was a, well, he was an aristocrat, like, um, who did this crazy experiment in his garage or in his shed that involved hanging balls from the roof with a bunch of pulleys and rods and um, basically used that to extrapolate the weight of the earth and the gravitational pull. It, it all comes from this one crazy experiment which no one's been able to reproduce. Well, one group I would say who didn't have a, a preconception was um, in the 6th century BC, there was a Greek group called the Phocaeans and who lived in southern France. And they um, were good sailors and navigators. They took their mathematicians, their astronomers, their best minds. They took, on, they took ships past the gates of Hercules, which is the rock of Gibraltar, and they headed north hundreds of miles to the um, like the British Isles as far as Norway, and they, they they discovered ice and snow for the first time, and they they calculated from observing the stars, you can see the stars were different there than they were in southern France, and just from that they calculated that the world was round by the position of the star, so they, in a sense, discovered that the world was round. And when, the one they came back to, back home to southern France, they actually wrote a book, and it became a big hit, and people were amazed, like snow and ice. They've never heard about this. The Mediterranean, the world's round. So this this book was like a bestseller, but it doesn't, uh, it didn't survive. Just fragments of it have been quoted in other books. So these are the Phocaeans, you know. Yeah. So they, I'll, they I'll discovered this. They didn't have an agenda. They just made a discovery. Yeah, yeah but, you know, probably based on um, erroneous assumptions, I'm guessing. I, I'd have to look into it, but... Um, it seems that pretty much um, the whole um, heliocentric thing is based on erroneous assum assumptions of people that didn't have the technology to um, to verify things properly. You know, like so he heliocentric means spherical, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it means um, well, helios is the sun, and heliocentric is the sun-centered solar system, basically. Oh, okay. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But, um, what was I saying? Um, oh, I can't remember, but I don't know. I, I think I've said pretty much everything that um, I have um, set out to say. Um, yeah, me too. I think I've covered everything. We've been talking um, almost two hours here, so it's quite thorough. We didn't know how long we were going to talk. I think we've done a pretty thorough job, so I guess it's um, we're, at a, we're at an impasse. Uh, <laughs> we're yeah, at an impasse, yeah. but it's a, a friendly impasse. Yeah, yeah, that was a good chat. Um, I'm glad 
you know, you, you asked some all the questions I hoped you'd ask. Um, so, yeah, I, I was. Yeah, and you e emailed me a few weeks ago saying um, my talk with Pete Papa Heracles, who were kind of making fun of the flat Earth, and you said you, you're shouting at the computer screen. You sent me an email. So I said, okay, let's do a video on it. <laughs> so here we are. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, well, hopefully in the future we can do a video on Sasquatch, which is what I've been looking into for the last year or so. <laughs> yeah, um, I've, I've got a, a, a video called uh, Bigfoot Buddhism and UFOs from 2012, because there's a Buddhist view in the Sasquatch. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely interested in the Sasquatch. See, I live man. in Vancouver, B.C., and they're they're around here. They're in the neighborhood. <laughs> they are. <laughs> they really are. Yeah, I've been looking into that for the last year, and it's just been blowing me away, you know, like, seriously, it's, um, yeah. And we, we might agree on the Sasquatch, I think we might agree on that, but that that's a, yeah, it's a fascinating subject, and I remember in grade eight, we had to give a speech once a year, and I chose the Sasquatch, and I said when I was a kid, you know, I was in Ontario, I said, I want to go out west to British Columbia and go look for one of these Sasquatches. <laughs> yeah. yeah, excellent. I was probably at that age wishing that I lived somewhere that had Sasquatches, but it turns out, you know, um, there was a New Zealand version called the Moiho. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. And, yeah, there's been fairly recent sightings as well, which just makes it even crazier. Like, they've spread pretty much all over the world. And, and um, they've, you know, got DNA proof of them, but ah, they're so elusive. Well, the Buddha describes them as um, a yaka, um, Y-A-K-K-A, -K -K -A, which is an interdimensional being from the first heaven, not quite a deva, a bit lower and it phases in, takes physical existence, and it phases out. That explains why they can pop up here and there, and you don't see any bones. Ah. So the Buddha actually had discourses with, with yakas, with, ah. with Sasquatch. I'd, so I'd in Buddhism, this is that. accepted, and uh, this yeah. is something that's really known. Like in Tibet, they have the Yeti, right? Yeah. If you could send me some of that information, I'd love to read that. Yeah. There's also, for the audience, on my, my video called uh, Buddhism, Bigfoot, and UFOs from 2012. Just type in YouTube, Brian Rue. Um, Bigfoot Buddhism, or just Bigfoot, you'll find it. I gave a, there's actually a, a Bigfoot YouTube channel that had me on a guest speaker as well. So oh, cool. on YouTube, just type in Brian Rue, Bigfoot Sasquatch, you'll see yeah, my videos, more than yeah, one the on reason that. I, <laughs> th that's the reason I brought this up. I saw that video um, last night, and I was actually looking for some listening material for work, and I saw that video and thought, oh, I'll have to show them my Bigfoot videos. So um, I'll watch that tonight, and... Um, yeah, I think you'll quite enjoy my ones as well. I've done a, a series um, that, you know, it, it goes into it in a lot yeah, of... Yeah, I want to take, take a look at your time. channel. Um, for the audience, again, tell them how they can get hold of you. Do you want to give your email address to the audience if people want to email you? Um, I'll just say you can find it on my page. Um, Yeah, because it's kind of an embarrassing email address, and you can find that out for yourself if you go to, uh, is it discussion or about? Um, go to about, and you can view my email address there. Very good. And and your uh, YouTube channel is called c.b.s. CBS. Yep. Calling all bullshit. There it is. Well, it's been great having you on the show, Robbie. Look yeah. forward to talking to you again. Any, any last uh, words, any last thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Um, yeah, just um, don't dismiss it out of hand because we all did first, you know. We all thought it was utterly ridiculous until we tried to um, disprove it for ourselves. And, and that's what kind of led me down the rabbit hole. And I'm kind of glad it did. I'm kind of glad I went there. But it has, you know... It causes so much division because some people, most people, um, they won't hear it and they, like, people actually get insulted when you bring it up, you know? Like, like, yeah. I know Stefan Molyneux, he's one of the most famous Canadian YouTubers. <laughs> I like his stuff. He's, he's quite intelligent, has some wisdom. And he had a flat earther on a show just like this on audio. And, and near the end of it, he said to the guy,